actually the word hallelujah. How many of you listening to the broadcast today know what the word hallelujah means? Maybe you're a first time listener. The word hallelujah means praise you, Yah, praise you, Yahweh. Hallelujah. That's why I like to like kind of put the emphasis there on the Yah because many people don't realize that. And um, one of the many things that um, tradition has hidden from the masses. And um, we talked last week about the Ten Commandments. And um, we covered the first three commands out of the Ten Commandments. And we're going to continue that talk here this week. And um, so, without any further ado, let me get to the right screen. The Ten Commandments, are we really keeping them? And this is part two of our study on the Ten Commandments. You know, um, hopefully I was able to challenge everyone last week, including myself. I know I challenged myself. Um, but, you know, it's, it's my role as uh, one who shares the word to, um, to cover things that will challenge most people and encourage them to walk more uprightly. And as the scripture has said in Matthew 5, that those who do and teach them uh, shall be called great in the age to come, and, and those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. And so it's my goal is um, to be among the great in the kingdom to come, I'm not claiming I'm there, not claiming I'll inherit that, but that's my goal. <laughs> so uh, I bring things that um, not only help those of you who are maybe still uh, involved in heavily in your churches and, and going to church every Sunday, and maybe you're watching the broadcast for the first time, and, and so I want to bring some things that will um, encourage you to look deeper into the Word and uh, and see some things that uh, tradition has taken away from uh, the walk and uh, the, the Yahshua walk, the Messiah-like walk. And also, um, as we go through these Ten Commandments, uh, challenge others um, who are already familiar with Sabbath keeping and and um, and one of these areas we're going to get into is honoring parents and, um, and we're going to see here that the expectation to honor our parents is a it's something that doesn't end with um, the time that we fly the coop and the, the time that we leave and cleave the the expectation to honor our parents, does not end there, and in fact, it extends until to their old age. And we're going to go over some scripture that will illustrate that as plain as day, clear as crystal. Uh, that is very true. And um, so, you know, in, in, we we talk about the Ten Commandments and, um, and how important they are, and and uh, a lot of uh, people in nominal uh, mainstream traditional churches also talk about the Ten Commandments and how important they are. And and so, um, you know, there's, a, there's an outcry against the removal of the Ten Commandments from uh, public places, courtrooms in different places. And, uh, you know, I, even the Supreme Court, you know, I've been into the federal court building and, and there are along the, along the, um, the doorway... Uh, you'll see engravings of different things, and some of the things you'll see are Ten Commandments. And um, so, you know, they, they, there it is in the in the you know the federal courts and the Supreme Court building, and yet you know some judge in Alabama is in trouble because he's got him in his courtroom. And and um, but anyway, we find we find this contradictions, you know, and but we find more and more that. Um, and there's a there's a backlash against um, this removal of Ten Commandments, and uh, there are more and more um, you know Christians believers who are putting the Ten Commandments out there on the lawns, and and um, and there are a number number of people who want to uphold these Ten Commandments, and um, and so it's it's at least among you know evangelical Christians, it's a, considered to be a positive thing to uh, believe in and want to follow the Ten Commandments. And so uh, if, you, if you don't believe you need to keep the Ten Commandments, then um, 
you know, maybe today's study is not going to be as persuasive, and we can get into other another topic um, as to whether they are valid today, uh, perhaps another time. But if you do believe in keeping the Ten Commandments, then what is going on here? Because most Christians, excuse me, who believe in keeping the Ten Commandments <clears throat> actually don't. And um, I don't mean to be arrogant or prideful, but um, we're going to look at these. Um, commandment number one, do you have, have another Elohim before me? We talked about that last week. Um, putting man in the place of Elohim. We talked about um, you know, the dangers of not putting Yahweh first in our life and the life decisions and the things that we do and, and whether or not we accept truth that's in the written word. He leads us to uh, Yahweh has to be a number one place. And we also talked about the second commandment and making carved images and and bowing down to them. Now, that's not such a, a visible thing, um, but nowadays man's his own Elohim. And uh, man likes to mold Yahweh into what they want Yahweh to be. Um, and so there's some dangers there. And then the uh, bringing of the uh, ghosts of paganism into our worship of Yahweh and trying to honor him with those things. Uh, we discussed that at length. And then the, four, the third commandment, um, not taking the name of Yahweh in vain, and and how we shared that the, uh, the very commandment as written in most places, in these public places, in the, and um, on the front lawns of people's yards and on churches and church buildings and and how that commandment, as written, is actually a transgression of itself. Because they take the name of Yahweh out of that commandment, thereby bringing it to nothing or making it vain, of no use, of no value, without uh, efficacy, and so on. And so, we went over that at length, and, um, and how we really have no business trying to rename Yahweh, or or messing with his word, or tainting and messing with it, and and pulling things out and putting things in. So, um, and so now, um, you know, we see that tradition has, has uh, placed man in the position of Elohim. And so man thinks that he can redefine how we worship Yahweh, our Elohim. We can bring pagan things into our worship of Yahweh. We can mold him into what we want him to be. And man thinks he is the one who can go into the scriptures and pull the name of Yahweh out and put some generic title in its place 7,000 times. Man thinks he has the rights to do this. And so since they have changed the way we worship him, and they've changed his name, is it any surprise? They change his day also. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. In it you shall do no work. So there's something that we are called to remember. Remember, remember, remember. Remember what? The Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. What is the Sabbath in the Bible? What? What is the Sabbath? You can look in the pages of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Rome, all the way to the end, and never find one place that any day of the week is ever called the Sabbath except one. And that's the seventh day of the week. That's the day that Yahweh blessed. He said to remember. So, um, and he goes on to say that uh, we're not supposed to do any work, nor our son, nor our daughter, or male servants, or female servants, or cattle, or stranger within our gates. And then he gives a reason. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So this is calling back as a memorial to creation. And Yahweh wants us to remember this particular day. To remember it. Not forget it, but remember it. And the one commandment 
that he tells us specifically to remember is the one commandment of the not the of the Ten Commandments. The one that he tells us to remember is ironically the one that most people today, even those who call themselves believers and followers of the Messiah, most do ignore the one he tells us to remember. And they redefine his day. They redefined his name. They redefine how we worship. And now they redefine his day. And actually, there are very few people who have any kind of problem with nine out of the Ten Commandments and following them just exactly as they were written. But for some reason, when it comes to the commandment regarding the Sabbath, we come to a myriad of perspectives. And um, no one would suggest, well, if you don't like your parents, then go ahead and just find some new parents that you like better. Maybe they're more, not so strict. And, um, and then honor them and call them your parents. Uh, no one would say that's acceptable, I hope. <laughs> it's laughable. And so if we think we, can, we should honor the parents Yahweh gave us, then why don't we think we should honor the Sabbath that Yahweh gave us? Why do we think we can honor a different day and then not be so strict? You know, um, And so well, and the reason why is because, you know, the Sabbath is, uh, when, you, when you start talking about the Sabbath, a lot of people associate the Sabbath with one of two things, either Judaism or Seventh-day Adventism. And Seventh-day Adventists, um, they have the Sabbath, and I'm glad for that. Um, but they also follow Ellen White as if she's a prophetess, which I don't agree with. And they also um, you know, ignore other things about the Scriptures that I don't agree with. So I appreciate their, their attention to the Sabbath. And we read this book from a Sabbath keeper who was a Seventh-day Adventist and... Um, and I appreciate their efforts to get the word out about that. But just like everything else, there's always more to learn. And we don't want to stop and set up our denomination and, and create all we've got the truth and everybody come to us and, and close our minds to anything else our Heavenly Father might uh, have in mind. And um, so anyway, but we, we come to all, you know, everyone accepts the nine commandments actually. Uh, there was a lady here at the health food store years ago who I asked she believed in keeping Ten Commandments. She said yes. And then um, I said about the fourth one, the Sabbath. She says, oh, we keep Sunday. I says, but is that what the Ten Commandments say? And she says, no. I says, so you don't believe in keeping Ten Commandments then, right? And she says, well, hmm. And then like a few months later, she was keeping Sabbath. Sometimes people just don't realize it. If you if you really believe in keeping Ten Commandments, then keep the Sabbath. Um, and that's the one that Yahweh gave. And even another person I've talked to in town um, would acknowledge, yeah, the, the seventh day is Sabbath. Saturday is a Sabbath. But we're going to keep Sunday anyway. I talked to a pastor one time um, who might have given some information on the Sabbath. And I talked to him on the telephone. And I said... Do you believe in keeping the Ten Commandments? Yes. Do you believe that you should keep the Sabbath? Yes. But we keep Sunday. I says, I understand that. But you understand the Bible calls the seventh day of the week the Sabbath? Yes. I said, but you keep a different day? He says, yes. I said, so basically you're telling me that you don't really think you need to follow the Bible on that? And he says, I guess you could say so. I guess you could say that. At that point, there was nothing else to say, uh, you know, except, all right, well, I guess you don't think you need to follow the Bible on that, then that's, you know, your choice. And uh, for me and my house, um, I want to do that. So, you know, but it's not surprising. You know, this is inconvenient, you know. Uh, uh, you keep a full day of rest, it has a major impact on your schedule and how you live your life. To stop what you're doing and take one-seventh of your time to devote yourself to resting and focusing upon spiritual things on a day that nobody else in your uh, congregation does or your friends do. 
and your boss at work might want you to come in on that. You know, it's too burdensome for some people in their minds. And so that's the reason why, in many cases, um, why out of all the Ten Commandments, very few people have differing views on what it means to commit adultery or murder or adultery or stealing. But when it comes to the Sabbath, all of a sudden views diversify. Everything gets different. And uh, But, you know, for instance, they say it's for Jews. Only for Jews he gave the Sabbath to. Um, but what I read in Scripture is that the Sabbath was there from the very beginning, long before there was ever a Jewish man. It said on the seventh day, Elohim ended his work which he had done. He rested on the seventh day which, from all his work which he had done. Then Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which Elohim created and made. So this is a day that was sanctified at creation. Now, when our Heavenly Father chooses to make something holy, we have to be very careful about saying, oh, that's not holy anymore. Especially when we have no scriptures in the Bible to back up this claim. Now, we see here it was made to be a holy day, and when our Heavenly Father makes something holy, with that comes an automatic responsibility on the part of man not to profane what he makes holy. His name is holy. We're not supposed to profane his name. And so his Sabbath is also holy. We're not supposed to profane his Sabbath. And the only thing we can find in Scripture that would indicate a man profaning his Sabbath would be to work on that day. Now Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were Sabbath keepers because they were also created in the image of Elohim, just as all of us were. And, uh, and since we are in his image, then we will do the things like he has done. Uh, seven, six days, Yahweh worked, did all his labor. Seventh day, the Sabbath. Why? As a pattern for us, we are created in his image. We are given a seven-day week, which has its origins at creation. Six days we shall work, on the seventh day we shall rest. We are created in his image, therefore we will do what he did. Our Savior, who is the brightness and expressed image of his person, kept the Sabbath day. And so, well, some people say, well, you know, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, I don't know, it doesn't really say in the Bible they kept the Sabbath. Um, but, you know, where does it say Abraham never committed murder, or Abraham never stole from somebody, or Abraham never committed idolatry or never committed a whole host of sins that we understand well of course Abraham wouldn't do why do we make a distinction why because our hearts are already biased toward doing what our culture says uh, we don't find that in scripture we, we we see Noah was told to refrain from eating blood he knew the difference between clean and unclean animals when he had them loaded onto the ark Abraham tithed. He offered sacrifices. Why do we assume he was not Sabbath observant? It's because of our Western Gentile mind and a, a tradition that has yielded to tradition. And so the truth is, the Sabbath day plainly existed since the seventh day of creation, and Abraham would have known that. And in fact, there were commandments and statutes and laws which Abraham actually did follow. And he was in obedience to those things. In, in Genesis 26, verse 4, And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And your, and your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So it was because Abraham's obedience here to commandments, statutes, and laws that his descendants were given the land that we call Israel today. So where were those statutes, commandments, and laws? Where were they written? Simple answer is they were already well known. They already knew about tithing. They already knew about sacrifices. Where was it written down about that? So you have to remember, though, in ancient times, men lived to be much older than they do today. I mean... Abraham, Adam, Seth, 
M's son Seth. He lived uh, into the time where close to the time of Noah. I mean, within I think 13 years, according to most timelines. And uh, and then Noah, he's 500 years old. He begets he begets Shem, and Shem would have actually outlived Abraham. Did you know that? That Shem, Noah's son, outlived Abraham. If you lay out the timeline and get everybody's ages and how long they lived and when they were born and when they died, Shem, Adam's or uh, Noah's son, lived outlived Abraham. In fact, he lived well into Jacob's time. And um, I think Jacob, Jacob was somewhere around 50 years old. And so for this reason, it was not difficult for the commandments and statutes and laws <clears throat> that were spoken of by Yahweh to Abraham. It was not difficult for the ways of Yahweh, the ways of righteousness, the ways that Yahweh created us to live, to be communicated from one generation to the next. I mean, you're talking about just a few generations. Anyone could have consulted Shem, Noah's son, and and um, and Seth, Adam's son, for eons, for hundreds of years. And uh, and so, for that reason, we we read this in Mount Sinai in, in uh, Nehemiah. It wasn't until they the the children of Israel's lives were shortened, and, and four generations went by, and they had lost these commands these statutes and these laws that Abraham was following. It says, You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, Nehemiah 9.13, and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath was already there. He just made it known to them, see? The Sabbath that existed, it was there. It was there for them to observe. But he had to make it known to them because they had lost it. Um, they didn't know about it through years of slavery. Uh, he told them to remember this day called the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And it's the only day in Scripture that was ever made holy. And there is no other indication of this day's holiness being canceled even today, in fact, the holiness of the Sabbath is written in stone by the finger of the one who kept it himself. And so the Sabbath, which was instituted and set apart during creation week, wasn't just made for the Jewish people. After all, does it really make sense? Heavenly Father rested seventh day of creation only for a Jewish man living 2,500 years later and then, um, you know, 1,500 years or so, yeah, keep a Sabbath, a holy, and then after that, cancel the whole thing. Or does it make more sense to you that Yahweh created the, made the Sabbath important? He kept it himself. He didn't need to rest. He wasn't tired. I mean, he doesn't wear out. He did it as an example at creation so that we would have one day a week we come together to worship him, to honor him, to remember him, to praise him, to think about him, to be a memorial to him being our creator. And so that makes more sense to me for all mankind for in, in, until Messiah returns back and there the Sabbath comes back again. There it is. still there. Actually, it didn't come back, but it'll come back for a lot of people. It, it's, it's still there. Even in the age to come. Read Isaiah 66, uh, 20 to the end there. Uh, one Sabbath to another and one new moon to another. All flesh will come and worship Yahweh. So it's consistent. He didn't, he, it's not, uh, you know, hiding it for, for a time and giving it and then taking it away and then bringing it back again and flip-flopping back and forth as to whether or not he wants us to keep it. What is he, a chameleon? No, he wants us to all keep it. And uh, it's our Western Gentile mindset that would suggest otherwise. And so, the Sabbath was made, didn't our Savior say something about the Sabbath was made for Jews, right? Oh, no. He said the Sabbath was made for man. Mark 2, 27. The Sabbath was made for man. Everyone wants to say, oh, the man's not made for the Sabbath. Oh, yeah. 
I'm going to pull that ox out of the ditch. In fact, open up an ox pulling out of the ditch uh, business on the Sabbath and uh, charge money for it. No. <laughs> what is The point was, yes, man was not made for the Sabbath. Don't turn it into something that's not. But the Sabbath was made for man. That's you. Are you a man? Are you part of mankind? And the Sabbath was made for you. Our Savior said it himself. So we recognize we're not made for the Sabbath. We don't worship the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for us as a blessing. Let's embrace that blessing. And even when Yahweh commanded Israel to keep the Sabbath, you know, Israel was not the only people that came with them out of the land. We talked about this recently. Exodus 12, 37 children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600 men on foot besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also. A mixed multitude. So they were not alone. They were Gentiles who went up with them also. And flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. So there were, there were other people of other lineages who went up, and they were part of the group that heard Yahweh's voice. From Sinai, commanding that the Sabbath be observed. Isaiah 56, verse 2. Yahweh said, Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps, his, keeps from defiling the Sabbath, who keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and, and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will, not, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And also the sons of the foreigner, the Gentile who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him, and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Everyone. I don't care if you're Jew or Gentile. He's talking to people back then. You thought the law was only for Jews. Well, that's not true. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. In fact, he says, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. You know, Yahshua quoted that part. He made it a den of thieves, supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. You turn into this den of thieves. As they were doing money changing and all this other stuff on the Sabbath, on, on Sabbath, but in the temple. And so everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, Yahweh wanted everyone to keep his Sabbath, no matter who their daddy was. Anyone who wanted to do what? Anyone who wanted to join themselves to Yahweh. The sons of the foreigner who want to join themselves to Yahweh. Do you want to join yourself to Yahweh? You're living in uh, ancient Israel. You want to join yourself to Yahweh. Start keeping the Sabbath. Start keeping the, the, the covenant that was given. And you will be blessed. And that's a promise. He says, I will accept you. I'll, make you even, I'll even make you joyful. I will bring you joy. You will delight yourself in me. You know, there is joy promised to those who keep his Sabbath day. We'll get more into that in a minute, but... And so, you know, our, our Heavenly Father created us in His image. He wants us to do His will. He invented the seventh day week. He works six days and rests of the seventh. And so if we are created in His image, I don't care who your daddy is. If your daddy's a Jew, your daddy's not a Jew. The Sabbath was made for man, and so the Sabbath was made for you. And so, now today, many Christians, oh, I keep the Sabbath. Oh, yes, sir, I keep the Sabbath. But then they go and rest on the first day of the week. 
Now that's a Christian Sabbath. See, that, that's their mind. The, Christ, the Messiah rose the first day of the week. That's the Christian Sabbath. Well, when did this happen? Because there, there's no scripture anywhere that would indicate such a change. Um, you know, there is a uh, tremendous amount of uh, confusion on this because even the ones who keep Sunday, they only talk about actually Sunday sunrise until midnight Sunday. They don't even think about, oh, wait a minute, when do days begin? Biblically, days don't begin at in the morning or at midnight or anything, any such thing, it begins and ends at evening. And so evening and morning was the first day, evening and morning was the second day, it started with evening. And so we need to understand that, um, that when the Sabbath begins in the evening, um, that's when the first day of the week begins also. The first day of the week also begins in the evening. And this has some interesting implications because when it comes to some of the statements in Scripture about the disciples coming together on the first day of the week, think of the first day, instead of thinking of the first day of the week being Sunday morning, think of the first day of the week being what you call Saturday night. And, uh, and this is the, the, the biblical way of looking at it. The first day of the week begins in the evening just after Sabbath ends. And so when we look at scriptures like this, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says, Now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So let's take off our, our Western Gentile glasses for a minute and consider the Hebraic, the biblical perspective. It's not out of question. This meeting actually occurred on what we call Saturday night rather than Sunday morning. And actually it makes more sense because Paul began speaking after the fellowship meal and was ready to go the next morning. Otherwise, he'd been speaking all day on what's called Sunday and all the way until midnight that night. I mean, only one meal is mentioned here, right? And, uh, and so this phrase... This coming together to break bread is a reference to a regular meal. And I can say that, you know, as, as we have kept Sabbath and attended congregations and fellowships on the Sabbath, a lot of times it's easier to wait until after sundown and then, you know, especially in the wintertime, and, and get together and have a meal. Because, you know, you can do whatever cooking you need to do, dishes or whatever. You know, if you're visiting someone's home, um, there's, there's a, it's easy to get together for a meal after Sabbath. And, um, and that's, I think, the disciples' intent. Um, they gathered after the Sabbath, a post-fellowship. Some people call it a havdalah or whatever you want to call it. I don't know if that tradition was there back then, but, um, you know, some think this means, all oh, Sunday morning, come together and have the Eucharist. Um, but it could have been just after Shabbat. They come together and have a meal together. And then Paul speaks a message to them till midnight after their meal. And then he goes the next morning, which is called Sunday morning. Um, so this phrase now, this phrase, breaking uh, breaking bread, came together to break bread. Where, can I show you in the scriptures that that does not necessarily mean what is called the Eucharist or the Last Supper or the Master's Supper? We see here in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says, Continuing daily with, and with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with some gladness and simplicity of heart, praising Elohim and having favor with all the people. And so here, every all the time, every day, coming together, break bread. Um, coming together to break bread is just an idiomatic reference to having dinner together. Yeah, you know, we see here in Acts twenty-seven thirty-five, Paul's breaking bread here with unbelievers. It says, as the day was about to dawn, this is on the ship, which is about ready to get shipwrecked. Paul implored them all to take food, saying, "Today is the fourteenth day, and you waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you." 
And when he had said this, he took bread and gave thanks to Elham in the presence of them. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. What do you do? Give them a Eucharist? They weren't even believers. They were people on the ship. No, they were just breaking bread. As breaking bread men, they're going to. They didn't have sliced bread back then. They had. They just would rip it with their hands, and break it apart and hand it out that way. And so they all were encouraged and took food for themselves. And so, getting back to this, um, Acts twenty. Um, Verse 7, um, the first day of the week, they come together to break bread. They had a meal. And, uh, and disciples are keeping the Sabbath on the seventh day. Then we're looking at a post-Sabbath fellowship meal. And, um, and by waiting until just after Sabbath to have dinner together, they could cook and do other things that would be associated with meal preparations. And in fact, it was common in that era to wait until after sundown on a daily basis to have your 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 meal. And so they would prepare their Sabbath meal on the prep, day of preparation called Friday, and then that night they would have a meal. And so it was not uncommon in those days. Now another reference that people use to say, well, they have, we keep Sunday now, is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must all do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And so, excuse me, so, looking at this passage from a Hebraic perspective, rather than a Western Gentile perspective, we see this event is potentially occurring on a, what's called Saturday night, rather than a Sunday morning, and for, because if the disciples were actually Sabbath observant, and I know they were, it would have made sense you wait until after Sabbath to handle monies and other items to put into treasuries, rather than everyone focusing on financial matters on the Sabbath. And so they stick together well until the, after sundown, and then they've got their finances and stuff to deal with, the post-Sabbath activities. And so... Neither of these two verses that are commonly quoted to support a change from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week actually prove anything at all. And rather, they really seem to indicate the normal practices of a Sabbath observant man in the first century. And so, in fact, everywhere we see this word Sabbath, in the book of Acts, other places in the New Testament, if the Sabbath had changed then we would see the word Sabbath referring to the first day of the week in the book of Acts. But no, whenever you see the word Sabbath, it always refers to the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week. And that's very telling because when all is said and done, I mean, we, we ought to be able to trust in the words of the Ten Commandments anyway, but if you want to go by the New Testament, the New Testament Sabbath is on the seventh day of the week, plain and simple. When it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, what day is it talking about? What's the New Testament Sabbath? What's the New Testament Sabbath? Everywhere you look in the New Testament, seventh day of the week is called the Sabbath. And so when it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, what day is it? It's very simple. And so, um, but the reason... People say, well, well, we, we've changed, you know, it's been changed because the Messiah was ro- risen on the first day of the week, and so that's the day we want to observe. You know, and to me, that's a very interesting concept because we know that the Messiah actually rested in the grave on the Sabbath, and then on the first day of the week, he went to go work. I go and prepare a place for you, and so off he went. What? On what day? On the first day of the week. And what do believers and followers of the Savior do? They work on the day he rested, and then they they rest on the day he rose to work, and then say we do it because he rose on that day. So the analogy doesn't even make any sense. Uh, and and what, why would we say, it seems reasonable to us that we're going to rest on the day he rose from the dead. It's just, a, it's just an attempt to justify tradition. And... Um, and so, 
we have a we and we actually if you look in the scriptures we have a um a multiplicity of examples of the messiah himself keeping the sabbath even when he was on the earth to which people say well he had to you know he was a jewish man living in the first century if he was a gentile man if he he would have had to keep the sabbath if he wanted to be obedient to our heavenly father uh it doesn't matter whether you're jew or gentile he wanted everyone to keep his sabbath and uh, we see that in Isaiah 56. And so we don't honor him by doing the exact opposite of what he did. Um, we're told to walk as he walked. We're told to live as he did. To, he is the example that we're looking to follow. And he, and he who says he abides in him ought himself to walk just as he walked. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. And then later, Paul says... Imitate me just as I also imitate the Messiah. Well, what did he do? Paul keep the Sabbath? Absolutely he did. We see that in a number of cases. And so how did Paul and how did the Messiah walk when it came to this commandment regarding the Sabbath? We know he rested the Sabbath. He didn't do it the way the scribes and Pharisees did the Sabbath. The scribes and Pharisees had taken the Sabbath day to an extreme that was never intended by our Heavenly Father himself. They turned it into a burden which no man could bear and added hundreds of extra biblical regulations and rules, some of which were contrary to Scripture. Uh, but our, our Savior never rebuked them for keeping the Sabbath day. He rebuked them for the way in which they kept the Sabbath day. Uh, the rulings of men that he took exception to and uh, any time we stray and we add to and we take away from the word, we're going to get rebuked by our Savior. I mean, if, if, he, if he was to come here today and he would look at the, the average believer going to church every Sunday and say, why aren't you doing what I did? Why aren't you living the way I lived? Why aren't you imitating Paul as Paul imitated me? Oh, because you rose on the first day of the week? What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? Nothing. <laughs> What's that got to do with the Messiah and his example? What did he do? And so that's the point. And, uh, and I realize some believe it doesn't matter which day you keep. Oh, well, you keep one day out of seven. Uh, that's the main thing. You know, we're not legalists now. We don't keep focus on uh, what day you keep. You keep a day out of seven. And it'll be okay. Well, let me ask you this question. I like this parable. I use it a lot. Uh, suppose there's a sheep farmer. He has seven sheep grazing his pasture. And the sheep farmer spoke to his son and he said, Son, I want you to take your cutters and go up on the hill and shear the wool off the seventh sheep, the one that we call Missy, and bring her wool back to me. I've set her apart for a specific purpose and we're going to take her wool we're going to make a garment out of it. And so the son goes up, takes his cutters, look, goes up on the hill, looks at the seven sheep, and rather than shearing the wool off of Missy, which is the seventh sheep, he looks at the first sheep and decides to shear its wool instead. And so the son shears the wool off the first sheep and brings the wool back to his father. Now my question is, did that son do his father's will? Of course he did not. And that's a tough question for a lot of people today. Did, it, did he do his father's will? And I've heard stumbling and bumbling over that question. The obvious answer is he did not do his father's will. I've heard people say it doesn't matter which will it was, um, but the father said he set apart that specific sheep for a specific purpose, uh, and bring the wool from that sheep. And everybody knows that if that son went up there and did something different than what his father told him to do, he did not do his father's will. And so the scriptures we read from every day, they make it very plain and clear. It's even written in stone with our Heavenly Father's own finger. He asked us to remember the seventh day, to keep that specific day holy, to rest on that day. Now we decide we're going to keep another day holy instead. Are we doing our father's will? Now, some are under the impression this age of grace, well, you know, the Sabbath is optional. Um, 
almost never the view of those who led the Protestant Reformation. As almost everyone in, in uh, early American history kept the Sunday Sabbath. In many areas of the United States, there's still laws on the books uh, called blue laws, which forbid commerce and any manner of work on Sunday. And that's why a lot of businesses are still closed on that day. And in fact, my grandfather, who's now 98 years old, coming up, I think. And my grandfather once told me a story. He was still a boy growing up in his parents' home. His mother had to care for an ailing relative who lived among them. And this relative was bedridden and sometimes would have soiled clothes that needed to be washed. And because of this, his mother was the subject of some local gossip and even got a visit from her pastor because there were clothes drying out on the clothesline on Sunday. So it wasn't really until fairly recent times a new viewpoint concerning the Sabbath starts to emerge. A viewpoint somewhat common in today's churches now that the Sabbath has been completely abolished, whether it be Saturday, Sunday, or any day, and now the Messiah is our Sabbath. We rest in him now that we have received grace. Did you know, though, that grace was a concept that was also in the Old Testament? It's not a New Testament idea only. It says, Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh, Genesis 6, verse 8. You know, Lot was a recipient of grace when he was spared from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The children of Israel were, were all a recipients of grace. Exodus 33, 16 says, Yahweh chose to bring them into the promised land in spite of their disobedience. And so we have in this New Testament now a revelation of why the Heavenly Father was able to give grace to Noah, to Lot, to the children of Israel. It's because the Messiah came and, and did his work in bearing our sins, the sins of the whole world. He's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, covering the sins of every man who ever lived. Every man has received his grace, who sought it, who repented, who turned away from sin and sought his grace, was recipients of it. And so... It's not like we live in this new era where all of a sudden everything was always law, never any mercy from Father Yahweh, and he never gave grace to anybody until the Messiah came and, and turned him into Grandpa. That's not true. And now Yahweh's sort of lenient now, you know. He's sort of calmed down. He's not so uh, emotional as he used to be in the Old Testament, you know, fire and brimstone. That's the attitude people take, and that's not true. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. And, uh, and so, it's just we have the blessing of knowing why and how are we are able to receive grace. Whereas until the Messiah actually came and died for our sins, few men understood how that was the mechanics of that. And so, we, in light of this understanding, what bearing does grace have on the Sabbath day? Does our head knowledge of why we're able to receive grace somehow change one of the Ten Commandments? that were written in stone by our Creator's own finger. If we look at it from a Hebraic perspective, the perspective of the entire counsel of His whole Word, then this, instead of just looking at the New Testament only and throwing out the rest, the whole notion begins to lose weight. Because, I mean, what about these? I mean, what about these? What about these New Testament verses? Everyone says, well, I rest in Messiah now. Yahshua Yash says, come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Break the Sabbath, all you who are laboring. Come and rest in me. You can break the Sabbath all you want. Just rest in me. Is that what he said? No. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from him. Do what he did. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. You're going to find rest for your souls by keeping the Sabbath, by cleaving to the Messiah, by doing what he did. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So it's true, he does give us rest, but is it the physical rest he's speaking of here? When we receive the Messiah, does he come and change our body structure so we no longer tired when we work for six days straight? No. So what kind of rest is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about spiritually rest. Don't go to these Pharisees who are going to lay upon you burdens heavy to bear, come to the Messiah. His yoke is easy. His yoke, his yoke is light. His burden is light. Learn from him. 
Learn from his example. Now here's an example you can follow. You can't follow the Pharisees and the scribes who turned the law into a burden. But you can follow the Messiah who took the Torah, the law, and, and interpreted it properly and doesn't turn it into some uh, harsh thing that was never intended by Yahweh. And so the rest spoken of here was um, was the Messiah. Yes, the Messiah. But it doesn't mean because you believe in Messiah, now you disobey what the Messiah commanded or we can, you can disregard his example and not learn from his example. No, we learn from his example. And so this statement had nothing to do with abolishing Sabbath or replacing the Sabbath with a Messiah's rest. It had to do with Messiah being our spiritual leader and our teacher rather than prideful men who would have us follow their own oppressive ways rather than the ways laid out in the scriptures. See, men are often judgmental and harsh in their leadership because of pride. But our Savior is lowly and meek of heart, patient, long-suffering, gentle in his leadership of our soul. And it's better to be under his headship and him being our shepherd than any man. And so the Messiah offers that kind of rest, that kind of leadership to those who desire to be uh, relieved from the affliction of men. He says nothing here about doing away with the Sabbath. He says nothing about um, him, you know, because we, we can break the Sabbath, we find rest. No, you find rest when you keep the Sabbath. I've never met a human being Christian or non-Christian, who can burn the candles at both ends and not suffer for it. Our Creator knew our bodies needed rest, and it's often for this reason. People are sick, don't have enough strength or the immune system to fight off disease. Um, our bodies were created to, to work, yes, but also to rest. Now imagine, though, if everybody kept the Sabbath. Our bodies would get the rest with needs to function properly. Workaholic men would have to come home and spend quality time with their families. And we would also benefit from the spiritual blessings. And so how do we keep the Sabbath day? He says, on the seventh day, you rest and all within your household rest also. As, as a memorial to creation. And so, we don't hire people on the Sabbath to do work for us. Restaurants, go to businesses, and you got the cashier there. You're basically hiring through purchases of goods and so on. We don't, we don't do commerce on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. And it says in Scripture, Isaiah 58, 13, If you turn your way your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Yahweh honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in Yahweh. See, then you'll find joy in Yahweh. You'll be joyful in his house of prayer. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of Yahweh has spoken. What's the, the heritage of Jacob? What is that? Eternal life in the promised land. That's a pretty good heritage. I'll take that one, won't you? Would you like to be fed with the, the heritage of Jacob? Yes. And we are all grafted in to the olive tree of Israel. And so Jacob is uh, in that olive tree. He is our father. And so what promises we have here if we're willing to call the Sabbath a delight and call his day honorable and honor him, not doing our own things, not even doing our own, not even speaking our own words. Let's speak the words of Yahweh to one another. You see, the Sabbath day is only a burden if you're so caught up in the world and its pursuits that it's burdensome to rest and draw near to him. Imagine that. Imagine that. And if it is a burden to you, then it's a sign that your heart's not in the right place. Because a day of rest shouldn't be a burden. And drawing near to Yahweh and, and wanting to hear his word shouldn't be a burden. I can tell you there's nothing burdensome about it because, you know, we've been keeping Shabbat since uh, 1990. I cannot think of one time in my life I've ever felt burdened by the Sabbath because it's the time of rest and renewal and refreshing. It's like a shining light at the end of the week saying, here I am. And, uh, and so, you know, what... Why is it that so many Christians, you know, will get saved, you know, 
and um, these new converts come in. They hear, they they're expected to keep strong by hearing one sermon a week. Maybe maybe another one on Wednesday, you know. But what if in, instead of that, instead of that, instead of, of just two hours on a on a what's called a Sunday morning, maybe an hour on a Wednesday night, so to speak. Um, what if we said there's a Sabbath day? Uh, where you can spend an entire 24-hour period and uh, withdraw yourself from the world, its influences, and concentrate on that one day. And we all keep it together, worshiping, praying, fellowshipping, studying the Word, enjoying creation, taking walks, spend time with your family, doing things together. Oh, what a burden? No, what a blessing. And in fact, that would keep so many people so much stronger, so much stronger. And I can tell you for myself, I don't think this old boy would have made it. And and the, the 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 faith that I have grown to love and uh and grown to to be a part of. Um there were weeks I got very weak. That's why they call it weak, right? <laughs> no, the work week. It make you make you work weak, doesn't it? Spiritually sometimes. The people of the world drag you down. But there's that Sabbath every week. And I don't know if I would ever made it. As I kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept me an old adage, you know, and it's very true. And so if we're willing to honor him and not do our own thing on that day, what's going to happen? Because we are focused on him, because we are attentive to the ways of Yahweh, it says right here, he says, you shall delight yourself in Yahweh. That's a promise. You will delight yourself in him. Speaking of honor, let's look at the, the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. Oh boy, what a mess our culture is in with this one. Here's Deuteronomy's version. Um, honor your father and your mother as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you, and it adds that your days may be long and that it may be well with you. And that it may be well with you in the land which Yahweh your Elohim has given you. Now that looks like a command to the Jews. Why do we, uh, it's in the land, you know, do you not honor your mother anymore since you're not in the land? Of course not. They do the same thing for the Sabbath. Well, this particular version, the one in Deuteronomy, is uh, the one that's actually quoted in, uh, in Ephesians. Okay, they, they say it's in the New Testament. Children, obey your parents and Yahweh, for this is right. Um, the Sabbath is also in the New Testament, Colossians 2, where it's expected to be kept. But I don't, I'm not going to get into that any further. Okay, I'm done with the Sabbath. <laughs> Let's move on to the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. That it may be well with you. There it is again. Do you want it to be well with you? Then honor your parents, especially children. Obey your parents, for this is right. Um, now, if we're lacking blessing in our lives, brethren, if we're having health problems, you know, it may be due to improper reverence toward those who are in an office that Yahweh says we ought to honor. It's not going very well for us. Things are, we're having trouble in our life. It might be, I'm not saying it is, it might be a lack of reverence toward those whom Yahweh has said to honor. You know that uh, we read or shared earlier a few weeks ago about Passover. You know, People um, were dying in the Corinthian assembly and were sick and weak because they were not giving proper reverence to the body of the Messiah. And here, um, if we want it to be well with us, we want blessing, then we need to provide the proper honor and respect toward those whom Yahweh has commanded us to honor. Now, I really believe this is a major area of trouble in our generation. The generation we live in today, brothers, is so, so, so irreverent. And, um, and some of us have lost the concept of what it means to honor our parents. And I would say, you know, I probably have in some areas. I, I just think I, I don't know what, how that means, what it means to respect and honor. You know, there isn't a check in our spirit sometimes when we do things 
that bring dishonor to our appearance. Our conscience has been seared and desensitized because of the culture we live in and its attitudes. You know, I quit watching TV about 14, 15 years ago. And back then, the comedy shows, you know, sitcoms, they would often highlight, you know, some smart mouthed little kid that was arrogant and disrespectful toward his parents. And it was supposed to be funny. You know, I've heard it said, uh, America is going to hell and they're laughing all the way. That's true. They laugh all the way and don't regard the things that Yahweh calls us to regard, that don't keep their bodies sanctified and, and possess their bodies in honor, the things that Yahweh has created. More on that next week. But, um, you know, Hollywood has become the primary preacher and teacher in many households today. Hours upon hours of Hollywood. And they issue their programming through the prince and the power of the air, right? I do say programming because that's exactly what it is. It's programming. And, uh, and there you'll receive doctrines of demons through the channels, channeling on your TV set. And uh, become trained and programmed and desensitized by the moral filth of the world as you sit spellbound for hours in front of a TV set. And you know the wand, uh, the, the magic wand that magicians use? You know what it's made of? Holly wood. No joke. It's made of holly wood. And uh, this is one of the many areas, you know, we have been taught to be irreverent, disrespectful toward the aged. Uh, Hollywood, instead of being honor honorable toward the those who are older and respectful toward those who've lived longer than we have and have more life experience and have more wisdom than we do, instead they glorify youth. Yahweh says, you shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your Elohim, I am Yahweh. Rise before the gray-headed. That means when a gray-headed man walks into the room, you stand up. I don't always remember to do this. Get up and give him your seat. Honor his presence. Fear your Elohim. You know what? If we as parents would do this ourselves, we might find it a lot easier for our children to honor us and to honor the presence of an adult. And uh, in fact, a young person is, even here in the New Testament, is not even supposed to rebuke an older man. Do not rebuke an older man, 1 Timothy 5.1. But exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older men as women as mothers, younger as sisters with all purity. And so we're supposed to treat other elders in the congregations and in this world as if they were parents and show them the proper respect as a father, as a mother. Show them the proper respect. He's talking to Timothy here, a young man. And, uh, and so Yahweh takes it very seriously. And um, it says here, Leviticus 20, verse 9, it says, For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. All you have to do is utter a curse toward your parents in ancient Israel, and you were a recipient of the death penalty. Yahweh doesn't waste time, does he? Scripture says, Proverbs 20, verse 20, Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. Deep darkness. Whoa. Proverbs 30, verse 17, The eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out, and the young eagles will eat it. Why, do the, why does it say that the ravens will pick it out. You know that birds of prey, if they want to find out whether or not the the animal or whatever it is that they're about to feast on is dead or alive, they'll peck at its eye. And if the eye is um, 
you peck at its eye and the, and the thing doesn't move or flinch or do anything, then they know that it is it is dead and then they can eat it. And, um, and so he's saying basically that you'll be a dead man. You won't live long upon the land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you. And it also says um, in Ezekiel 22 verse 6, says, Look, the princes of Israel, each one of you has used his power to shed blood on you. In you they have made light of father and mother. You know what the word honor means in Hebrew? It means to, to make heavy. See? It means to carry weight. You know, an, an older man walks into a room. Everyone shuts up and gives weight. Everyone rises, gives him proper respect. That's the attitude the Yahweh wanted us to do if we were living in that time. I don't think anything's changed. I don't think I don't think Yahweh has changed. How about you? Do you think he's changed? I don't think so. You don't even make light of your parents. Don't even make light of them. Give them the honor that's the weight which they are due. And uh, this is some... Uh, listen, brothers, <laughs> I'm right along with you. I I need to do this better. I need to do this better. And uh, it says, Every one of you, Leviticus 19.3, shall revere his, fa his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I am Yahweh your Elohim. That's your memory verse, children. Uh, ties in with today's study. Keep his Sabbaths and honor your parents. Give them the proper reverence, too. If you know, in, in Scripture, if you were to, to, to hit somebody, it was eye for eye and tooth for tooth. You know, you, you read that in the Torah and in the Scriptures. Uh, but if you hit your mother or father, he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Am I getting your attention here at all? I mean, I, I, I hope so. Death penalty. Now, you might read that and go, wow. Boy, Yahweh sure was harsh back in those days. Good things were under grace. Wait a minute. You know, Yahshua, when he wrote to uh, one of the congregations, he says, if she doesn't repent, I'll kill her children with death. We read 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, or 1 Corinthians 11, um, that many are dying because they're not giving Messiah's body proper reverence. Do you think he's really changed? Uh, when Yahweh, you know, he, he might have mercy on you. He's had mercy on all of us. But we understand that when we see his punishments for certain things, that he takes it very seriously when he gives a death penalty. He takes it very seriously. Here's another example. He did not put up with children who were stubborn and rebellious. It says, Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they've chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of his city, and shall say to the elders of his city, The son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all of Israel shall hear and fear. See, Yahweh didn't want bands of rebellious teens corrupting the society in Israel. They were taken care of pronto. And all it would take is for this to happen once a generation. And I assure you, teenage rebellion would not be a problem. Uh, now, you, you might, some of you are, you know, might laugh at this and say, well, that's the old law, you know, ha, ha, ha. And uh, why don't you go live in Iran or something, Eliyah, you know. Now, they probably have that kind of thing. We're not here in America, you know. Well, don't laugh at something Yahweh commanded. He was serious when he gave this command. It's, and we mock it, it's irreverent toward him. See, we've lost what it means to be reverent. Yahweh understood the seriousness of teenage rebellion and the, and the youth. How many lives would actually be saved? And one rebellious teen loses his life, and for a generation, others are going to look at that and say, well, like what happened to so-and-so? You know, and fear. There wouldn't be nearly as many murders, you know, teenagers running around doing drugs and shooting each other and killing each other and 
killing people at convenience stores and all these things you, you hear about. You know, there wouldn't be these problems in society. Now, I'm not saying that we need to do this in our society today because unless our society also adopts all of the principles in Torah to go along with it, including righteous judgment, uh, something's going to get abused and mishandled. But what I'm trying to convey here is the seriousness to which Yahweh speaks on this topic. He considered cursing our parents, hitting our parents, or even rebelling against our parents to be a crime worthy of death. He commanded us to respect and to revere them. And so when it comes to respect and honor, we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention and we need to reprogram ourselves. We have to do some deprogramming first, see? The world's program us one way, we gotta deprogram it that way. It may take years, it may take time. Reprogram us another way. And so what areas are we falling short today? Here is a major, major, major area. In Matthew fifteen, verse one. It says, the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Yahshua and said, Why do you disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Oh, you're, honor you're dishonoring our elders. Our, our elders gave these traditions and you're dishonoring them. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of Elohim because of your tradition? And uh, he was pointing out, how their traditions transgress the commands, and therefore you don't follow those traditions. And he goes on to say, For Elohim commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or his mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me, oh, it's a gift to Elohim then he need not honor his mother or his father or his mother. Thus you've made the commandment of Elohim to know of no effect by your tradition. What's he talking about here? What's he talking about? Well, back then they didn't have social security programs, you know. <laughs> uh, and they, the children are expected to take care of the older generation when they're no longer able to work because of weakness of bones and diseases or, or whatever, just overall not a, no, don't have the strength of youth. They're expected to take care of their parents. And what they were doing was they were taking their possessions and, and saying, well, that is that is devoted. That's Coburn. That's devoted to Elohim. And then they would be relieved of this need to honor their parents because their possession that might have been given to their parents was instead, oh, give it to Yahweh. Oh, wasn't that an honorable thing? Give it to Yahweh. But they're Real heart motivation was that they wouldn't have to be without and repay their parents. That was the heart motivation. And that's what Messiah was concerned about. And so they, and, and listen, he considered, this is where I was talking about, that when your parents get older, this is the way you honor them, is if they're in need, you provide for them. They provided for you when you were naked and and couldn't do anything for yourself and uh and so when they get older and they're incapacitated or can't take care of themselves you have a duty to honor them by providing for them and that's what messiah is talking about here that's how a person honors their parents when they as they get older is one way not the whole way but is by taking care of them and that's part of your duty as a human being on this earth is to do that and so hypocrites he says well did isaiah prophesy about you saying these people will draw near to me with their mouth honor me with their lips but their hearts far from me and in vain they worship me teaching his doctrines the commandments of men and so um, they weren't really honoring their elders they were just putting on a show and he exposed them for what they were. Now, Yahushua considered it to be such a dishonor to parents that w when, when children don't provide for them as they age. And, you know, because, you know, Yahweh's ordained that they return the favor. And, um, and in fact, we see here, it's the duty of not only children to honor their immediate parents, but also grandchildren. 
to honor their grandparents. And we see this, it says, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 3, honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them, who? The grandchildren. Let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. Get that? So whether you have a grandpa or a grandma or a mother or a father, you have a certain amount of responsibility biblically to repay them. To repay them. Got to pay them back. That's how it works. They took care of you. They took care of your parents who took care of you. And therefore, you take care of them when they're not able to be taken care of. Otherwise, what are you going to do? Tell other people to take care of them? <laughs> other people, oh, that's my parents. They provided for me. They, they uh, clothed me. They, they worked hard for me so that I could live on this earth. And then you expect other people to pay for them? Expect other people to take care of them? And so the importance of honoring and providing for mother and father here is extended to the grandchildren if the need does arise. And if we keep reading, we're going to see the very, very strong condemnation is given to those who don't do this. He says, Now she who is really a widow and is left alone, trusts in Elohim and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. She who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. Pardon me. And if anyone does not provide for his own, his own what? his own parents and grandparents. So that's the, that's the context. If you don't repay your parents, if you don't provide for your own, and especially for those of his own household, now, now we're talking about, okay, children and wife and so on. But here we're talking about parents and grandparents. If you don't take care of your own, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an unbeliever. Plain and simple. I didn't say it. Yahweh said it. I just delivery boy here. And so, very, very interesting uh, comments here. Expectations on our part. And uh, so, if a person refuses to provide for their parents, especially their own household, yes, they deny the faith. Yes, they're worse than an unbeliever. And many believe, yeah, that's talking about a man providing for his wife and family. The context. Parents and grandparents. And so today, the older generation, we see that. What we see is the older generation become a, a, um, a major drain on society because, because of children who won't take care of their parents. And as it, the older generation is set aside, disregarded, abused, shoved away in nursing homes so no one has to look at them. No one has to talk to them. No one has to think about them. Out of sight, out of mind. Ah, but Yahweh does see. Yahweh does see. And he's mindful. Now, there are cases where it's physically impossible for a person to provide the medical care and so on of a parent. I'm not here to condemn anybody. But oftentimes, really, it's for the convenience of the children. It's for the convenience of the younger generation. The parent, you know, but your parents didn't put you in an institution when you were children locked away from society and the vibrance of life. Um, why do you suppose it's okay for children to do this to their parents? You know, the older, there, you know, there they are. There the older generation sits, and this bothers me, in a nursing home, bored out of their minds with nothing to do but be sit and be programmed by a television set. I believe, really believe, this is Satan's ploy. See, this is his plan. There are many widows and many older people sitting in nursing homes who are bitter at life, bitter at Yahweh, bitter at their own children because they don't come and visit. And they need salvation. They need a Savior. They need to know Yahweh and His truth and His Messiah. And so here they are in the last throes of their life. And there they are, locked away in a nursing home where they're unlikely to ever find salvation, especially sitting in front of a TV all day long. That's wrong. That's just wrong. Shame on us. Shame on us. And it ought not be. 
Now, if you can't provide the medical care, do everything you can to spend time with that parent, to enjoy that person's fellowship. You might learn things about them. You never knew. You might learn things that you need to learn. And in fact, we ought to be honoring them and providing them, providing for them, not just physically, not just not just with money, but with fellowship, with time, with, with love. Not shipping them off to isolation chambers where some paid help comes in. Um, they ought to be partakers in the joys of the life Yahweh's given us. Uh, th- you know, they've, they're the one that gave us our life, right? I mean, through Yahweh. Uh, and if they can't take care of themselves, what would be wrong with hiring a nurse to come in and, um, and maybe take care of them in our house? And maybe it'd be hard for you to bear because maybe they're rude, maybe they're uh, un- unappreciative, and maybe whatever. Um, maybe they're not saved. Um, but you know, I, I think you know a lot of parents save up money for their children to go to college. Maybe if our parents are not financially well off, we should be saving for the day when we might be required to care for them. I mean, didn't they spend a tremendous amount of time and money? Caring for us, in most cases, yes. I know, brothers, we've lost it. We've lost the reverence. We've lost it. And I know I need to do more to honor my parents. I mean, I call them every week. I could easily call my dad one of my best friends. Yeah, I mean that, Dad. I really do. Um, I know he wants that. I want that. And um, my father is a great man. And a very wise, a lot of common sense. And so is my mother. And and she's given me a lot of love, uh, unconditional, very patient. And they've helped me to be the person I am today, and I, I want to honor them for that. But, you know, as of 2002, they became Sabbath observant, feast keeping believers in Yahweh, and call upon his name, and, and thanks to Yahweh's grace. But I know there are some of you maybe don't have that blessing, and some of you might have parents that have been very hurtful, very abusive and maybe you're bitter at them and and some of you maybe refuse to talk to your parents some of you blame your parents for a lot of things in your life and you feel it gives you the green light to dishonor them it doesn't we are in this generation spoken of in Proverbs 30 there is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother there is a generation that's pure in its own eyes yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. And there is a generation whose teeth whose teeth are like swords, whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy from among men. They want the inheritance, but they don't want to give. There is a tendency, brothers, to blame mother and father Mother and father, for every problem you ever had in your whole life. And with that comes this attitude of, oh, they were so bad to me when I was growing up. You know, yeah, I wonder, how, how many of us think back and say, you know, I wasn't really treating my parents very well in those days either. And may, maybe I wasn't very sweet. I wasn't very respectful of them. I wasn't very submissive. I wasn't honoring them. Like Yahweh told me to, I was stubborn and rebellious. Maybe that's part of what fed the abuse that I got. Maybe I was a stumbling block to them, just as they were a stumbling block to me. And we all needed a Savior. And here I am, sit and condemn them. And that's what I'm talking about. We're a generation that's pure in its own eyes and doesn't even think about the ways they're dishonoring their parents and doesn't even think about the ways that they have done wrong to their parents. And so we're not washed from our filthiness. We refuse to repent. And Yahweh is a witness. There's no recognition of our own guilt. And many times children grow up, they find themselves repeating many of the same things, some of the wrong behaviors they saw in their parents. Because Yahweh is in heaven saying, Oh, your parents are so evil, huh? Well, you know what? I gave you those parents. And here, what, see how well you do, son. Let's see how well you do, daughter. When you have your own children, your own children start acting like you did. (laughs) 
and our judgments come up as a memorial before Yahweh our Elohim, and he allows us to be tested in the same manner in which our parents were tested. And maybe that happened to their generation too, and their parents, and their parents, and who knows when. You know, but sometimes the, there are things our parents did that were even right and biblical. But because of our bitter judgments against them, we don't see it in the Bible, and we associate the biblical things they did with being evil, simply because our parents did them and we're bitter at them. You know, I, I cringe when I hear people blasting their parents on the Internet, and the Facebook, and news media, and social settings. Oh, my parents did this wrong. My dad was abused me. My mom abused me. They did this. They did that. You know what? There's no good reason to dishonor our parents that way. None. No good reason for it. Why bring it up? To gain sympathy? Uh, I mean, the gloat and self-pity? I mean, what's the point? You don't have to bring it up. And, you know, self-pity is just pride because, you know, there's a pride that stems from trying to gloat in our accomplishments. And glory in how much you've had to, there's also a pride that's, oh, look what I've had to endure. Look what I've had to do, live through. You know, boasting and bragging sounds self-sufficient. Well, self-pity is boasting in your own self-sacrificing. Oh, look what I have to go through. Look at me. And, I, you know, it's not really out of a desire to be seen as a helpless victim and need of a savior, but as a hero who has endured so much evil from so many people. And I sit in rooms, and I, even among brothers and sisters, sometimes I see self-pity competitions going on. Well, my dad did this, and my dad did that. Oh, yeah, well, I grew up, my dad. Yahweh forbid. You know, the first murder was inspired in part by self-pity. Cain wallowed in his own pity, feeling that he didn't deserve to be rejected by Yahweh, so he got envious and jealous of his brother and murdered him. It all started with him pitying himself rather than repenting. And so if, if our peace and our happiness is based on everything going right in our life, guess what? Our life will be miserable. Maybe if we chose to crawl out of our self-pity party and seek to honor those who aren't deserving of honor, we might actually become a living example of the Messiah to those people, those parents. Maybe our parents haven't found salvation and won't repent of, our, of their own wrongs until we've demonstrated Messiah to them by willingly bearing the wrongs to, them, to, to that they've done against us. Maybe part of the reason for their rejection of our faith is because we're due to a lack of reverence toward them. Maybe if we, if you, if some of you listening today, if, if you haven't been honoring your parents, you might actually reach your parents with this faith if you took the time to honor them and reverence them. And when they get this honor and reverence, they know they don't deserve. Down deep, they know they don't deserve. That's when conviction hits. That's when conviction hits. And sometimes, yes, parents do things that are despicable. I understand that. But it's the office you're honoring, brothers. It's the office. Police officer comes by, pulls you over. He might have just beat his wife the night before. doesn't matter. He's in the officer. He's in the office. Show them proper respect. Same is true of our parents. They did something wrong. It's the office you got to respect. They're the ones that Yahweh used to bring life to you. You honor them and you respect them. They may not have been perfect, but guess what? Neither are you. And in most cases, they fed you, they held you, they took care of you, they provided for you, and you owe your very life to them at a bare minimum. Respect the fact Yahweh has, is the one who chose them to be your parents. And you don't get to choose who your parents are. Yahweh made that decision for you. And since he's the one that decided it, to disrespect your parents is to disrespect the one who gave you those parents. It's like someone giving you something and then you complaining about it. Be thankful for what you have, which is life on this earth and an opportunity to receive eternal life through the Messiah Yahshua. Because after all, if we hadn't had the parents Yahweh gave us, ask yourself, would you really be choosing Yahweh today? Would you be choosing a Savior today? Ever think about that? You know, you're mistreated by your parents as a child. You grew up in different homes. Say, say you grew up in a home that molded your mind in such a way that you would never have known Elohim. 
Maybe you would be an atheist to the day of your death, headed for the lake of fire. What would have been your choice? An afflicted childhood and receiving eternal life and joy and blessing, or the pleasures of this age, and a comfy childhood that spoiled you to the point to where you never cared about spiritual things, and you enter into the gates of hell with weeping and gnashing of teeth. What would be your choice? And that's the way I look at it. No parent is perfect. No child goes through childhood completely unscathed with some of the mistakes of the parents. The bottom line is, Yahweh has the one who put us in that position. Give him praise and glory. And honor the ones he's put in that position. Because you know what? If it had been anybody else, you might not have been a believer in Messiah. And so be thankful. A certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But then there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was when the beggar died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may bit, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good, your good things. Likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. What would you take? What would you take? We see a principle here. If you've endured evil things, we don't want to make things worse than ourselves. Than on ourselves. Because the day is coming when we will be comforted. Don't make things worse on yourself by disrespecting and slandering those who did you wrong. Best thing to do is look back and say, you know what? Yep, I endured some evil things, but I have Yahshua in my life. Maybe I wouldn't have chose eternal life, and uh, one day I'll be comforted. So all goes back to the need, brothers, to be humble. To accept and even find the good in the things that we've been through. We can murmur and grumble for the rest of our life about what, who, what, where, when did to us. Or we can it's just eat us up like cancer, maybe even die of cancer from it. Or we can look at things from a heavenly perspective and just say what Yahweh says. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. That's the fifth commandment, and there are no exceptions given in the Bible. Otherwise, children could pick and choose depending on how righteous their parents were. I mean, where would you draw the line anyway? So, brothers... Are we really keeping the Ten Commandments? A lot of the other commands in Scripture flow from the top ten of how to love him and how to love one another. And he's a jealous Elohim. He's jealous for his name. He's jealous for his day. And we should not dishonor him by disregarding the holiness of the Sabbath or disregarding the need to give proper honor toward the parents he has placed in our life. May Yahweh strengthen us to do his will. And set our minds and our affections and our cares and our concerns upon the heavenly things, the spiritual things, that we might truly live as Yahshua lived and ultimately be where he is. The Ten Commandments have much more to teach us. May Yahweh bless you, my beloved brothers and sisters, and may Yahweh truly have mercy upon us all. Thank you.